Okay, welcome to our Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for tonight, August 3rd, 2023, with the great John Rosengren. Uh, John will be discussing a book he wrote uh, about 15 years ago. Um, it got retitled, and it's the 50th anniversary of the uh, year that the uh, of the book that he's going to be speaking about. It's it's a great book about a great year. So we're going to get to that in, in a minute or two. Just some other things. Um, we have uh, Peter Blauner here. Peter, I'm going to give you about a minute to talk to these uh, 28 people. Fire away, and uh, then we're going to get a couple more things out of the way. But you have one minute to talk about your uh, upcoming endeavor. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, uh, Gary was kind enough uh, to invite me on to uh, the group here. I'm a New York City-based uh, author, novelist, journalist, TV writer, and I'm writing a book um, that takes place against the background of that great 1951 season. And I'm trying to recreate the New York City and the polo grounds of that year. So I'm just looking for anything that helps me bring alive the sights, the sounds, smells, uh, even of that ballpark. Um, I'll put uh, my email address in uh, a message to the group uh, a little later on. Uh, but I'm just glad to be here. And and I've really enjoyed uh, some of the sessions that uh, I've uh, listened to already and some of the contact that I've had with people already. And look forward to hearing more. Thanks a lot. Great, right, Peter. And of course, uh, when the book comes out, you have a place to uh, talk about it, okay? Thank you, Gary. Um, next week, there'll be no meeting. The following uh, week will be the 17th uh, with um, Fritz Buckaloo. Fritz will be talking about Carl Hubble. And then the following week, uh, it'll be on a Wednesday with Artie Wilson Jr. talking about his dad, Artie Wilson. And... Uh, for those who don't know, Will, when Willie Mays was promoted, Artie Wilson was sent to the minors. Is that August 23rd? August 23rd. Okay, that'll be a Wednesday. Um, I sent out a newsletter. I hope everybody got it. It has all the dates for all of the, the upcoming meetings, basically, till the uh, end of October. So uh, we will go from there. Um as far as tonight, John Rosengren has graced us before. He, of course, wrote this great book and he discussed it out of their lives with Johnny Roseboro and Juan Marichal. Fabulous book. And then again, in, in 2008, he had a book out called Hammering Hank, George Almighty and the Say Hey Kid. I just have a little picture of it. And to celebrate its 50th anniversary, it just came out on paperback with a new new title and a uh, new cover. So, John, welcome back. I am so glad John is the only guy I email that constantly gets kicked back to me. So I'm so happy he was able to get uh, my Zoom link via his phone. John, welcome aboard. Thanks so much for coming. Hi, Gary. Uh, thanks for having me. Nice to see all of you again. Um, I have to notice there's another esteemed author in the group there from Minnesota. Um, <laughs> And I, I just happen to have his book here. Dan Levitt wrote this with uh, Mark Amore, and uh, it's an award-winning. Is it the same more medal it got, Dan? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, and I, I got the highest honor from Saber. So um, anyway, I just um, received this and have started. It's a great read, so I recommend it. Um, once you finish my book, go to Dan's, <laughs> or you can read Dan's than mine. Um, so I, I'll tell you a little bit about how my book came to be, and then I'll talk a little bit about the book, and then I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, as um, Gary mentioned, I had wanted to write a bit, well, I'll, I'll, I wrote this book initially, uh, it was published in 2008, and um, I wanted to write a baseball book because uh, I inherited a love of baseball from my father. And um, I was looking for a season where significant events happened that I believe changed the course of the game. And I found it, I think, in 1973. Um, it was the year that Steinbrenner bought the Yankees. The designated hitter rule was introduced in the American League. Hank Aaron was chasing Babe Ruth's iconic 714 mark. 
And then the Mets and the A's played a seven game world series where Willie Mays passed the torch of superstardom to Reggie Jackson. Um, so the book was originally published as this hammer and Hank, George almighty and the say, Hey kid. Um, that, that might be the worst title ever in publishing history. Nobody could remember it. Um, and so the book was a, um, it was a critical success, but it was a box office flop. So I was able to tell, uh, convince the author, uh, sorry, the publisher to reissue the book on the 50th anniversary of the season, give it a new title, a new cover, and just some tweaks inside to update it. And uh, they came up with this, um, Great Summer in Baseball History. So I think um, I, with this makeover, I'm hoping it's going to get some more attention. Um, but since it had been a while since I'd initially wrote this book, I thought I need to go back and reread it before the it gets reissued so that I know what I'm talking about when you know I, I give these presentations. And um, I did that with a little trepidation because it had been 15 years and I wondered if I'd like the writing or if I'd think it had, uh, you know, it, it wasn't well done. And uh, I was a little scared about what I was going to find. But I'm happy to report that I was actually pleasantly surprised to go back and reread it and find that I enjoyed it again. And there was even one line that made me laugh out loud. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'll let you find that for yourself. Um, but there's one in there, I think, at least one. That's a, well, for me, it was a side splitter. Um, so in 1973, what was going on? Uh, let me put this in context for you. Uh, the World Trade Center opened in 1973. The Sears Tower became the tallest in the world. Skylab launched. The first mobile phone call was made. The ATM was introduced. So those are some of the significant events happening in our culture. Um, people were eating jello salads, deviled eggs, and hamburger helper. Um, They're listening to Tie Yellow Ribbon, Bad Bad Leroy Brown, and Crocodile Rock on the radio. They're watching All in the Family, The Odd Couple, and The Price is Right. And the Saturday doubleheader at the Rosengren household was Mary Tyler Moore followed by Bob Newhart. At the movie theater, they were seeing, it was, it was uh, not Barbie and Oppenheimer, but it was The Exorcist, Deliverance, Live and Let Die in American Graffiti on the big screen. Um, and some of the significant events that were going on, President uh, Nixon was sworn in for a second term in January. Um, he spent the year dealing with Rodgate unraveling and the hearings on TV attracted huge audiences. Uh, the US signed the peace accords and began to withdraw from Vietnam. Roe versus Wade was decided. The ERA was being discussed and ratified by states. Marlon Brando refused his Oscar for The Godfather in solidarity with the American Indian Movement, which had taken over Wounded Knee. There was the OPEC oil embargo, energy crisis was going on, and gas was in short supply. And game five of the National League uh, Championship Series was interrupted with news of Vice President Spiro T. Agnew resigning um, after the Department of Justice had uncovered bribe. So, um, uh, some things don't change, it seems, or the more things change, the more they stay the same, uh, with a politician being um, forced to resign by a Department of Justice investigation. Um, anyway, so as often happens, what um, was going on in society was playing out in sports as well. Baseball reflected society that season in 1973 with racism, revolutionary changes, big money, which brought along greed and corruption and the unchecked ego of the me generation. Let me briefly touch on the five major storylines going on in this book. Um, first off is the designated hitter rule. Um, baseball was in crisis because fans had soured on the game after the 72 strike. Uh, and then in 73, the owners locked out the players from spring training. Um, so attendance was down, TV ratings were down, Forbes, Forbes magazine, had predicted that baseball could well vanish from the scene in 20 years. Um, so it was especially uh, um, noticeable in the American League where they seemed to be hit hardest by it. And so the owners came up with the idea of this um, permanent pinch hitter or uh, designated pinch hitter, as they called it at the time. They decided they'd start a three-year experiment with that in 1973. Well, it worked so well. Uh, it increased hits, homers, runs, attendance, that they made it permanent 
after a year. And of course, one of the other, and so, I mean, this obviously reflects the changes uh, going on in the game today too, but um, back then, I think it was the most significant rule change in the century. Um, and it, it did, you know, one of the benefits was it extended the careers of players like uh, Orlando Cepeda, Rico Cardi, Tony Oliva. And um, I tell the story of the designated hitter rule change through Orlando Cepeda, who had actually retired after the 72 season until the Boston Red Sox called him and said, hey, we come hit for us, and he was the first player hired specifically as a designated hitter. Moving on to the Yankees, um, George Steiner bought, Steinbrenner bought them for a bargain basement price from CBS, which had paid thirteen point two million in nineteen sixty four. Steinbrenner bought them for ten million, um, and the team had been losing games and money. They hadn't won a pennant from nineteen sixty four to nineteen seventy three. This was, you know, a significant drought for uh, Yankee fans who are accustomed to significant success in the coming off the dynasty, particularly in the 50s. Um, so Steinbrenner invested heavily in restoring their glory. He gave them the highest payroll in team history to that year. And uh, two years later, it signed Catfish Hunter to a $3.2 million contract plus a million dollar signing bonus, um, which may, uh, made Hunter the first major free agent and mark the beginning of this infusion of money into the game. And I know when we you hear of a guy signing a $3.2 million contract, you think, my God, he must be like a reserve uh, infielder or something, you know, or the bat boy even makes more than that these days. But back then that was huge. I mean, the highest paid player in the game was Richie Allen at 225,000 a year. So that puts things in perspective. I mean, the guys weren't making a lot. They're all, uh, Steinbrenner made Bobby Mercer the third, only the third player in Yankee history to get a hundred thousand dollar salary after uh, Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. So that was um, big money that George started investing in the game. And of course, he said famously he'd stick to building ships. But he, during spring training, he gave the manager a list of players who needed haircuts. He just couldn't uh, help himself from meddling with how the team was run, and he was so off-putting in that, that he, uh, by the end of the season, the manager had quit, the general manager had quit, and one of his major investment partners had quit uh, because he just couldn't help himself. Um, so it was, um, I mean, and then, of course that foreshadowed what we were to see to come with this, uh, you know, narcissist driven by an insatiable need for attention, a consummate liar and a corrupt uh, one as well, who faced 14 felony counts for illegal political campaign practices at the time. So I, I go through all that in the book, um, talk about George's, uh, what he was doing with his uh, his con campaign contributions and lying to cover them up and coercing others to lie as well. Um, for the Mets, it was uh, the new team in New York. Uh, it was the year of it ain't over till it's over, Yogi Berra's famous uh, quote. Uh, because at the end of the, the Mets were in last place at the end of August and they rallied to win the pennant as uh, well. They first won their division, then the pennant. Um, so they went from last to first. And um, also as the year of uh, Tug McGraw's famous, you gotta believe rallying cry. Um, and so they took the A's to seven games in the world series. It was a colorful team. Uh, Tom Seaver won the Cy Young award. Uh, he only won 18 games, but he was uh, good enough to get him that far. And of course, they faced the A's in the World Series, who are a colorful, ragtag bunch of ruffians that could play ball. Uh, guys like Catfish Hunter, Raleigh Fingers, and Reggie Jackson. Uh, they're at the peak of their dynasty. Um, they bickered and fought among themselves, but were united in a common enmity toward their owner, Charlie Finley, who uh, on the West Coast, uh, had his share of uh, despicable traits as well. Uh, among them, he was notoriously cheap, and the players resented him for the way he bullied them with their with his checkbook. Um, Finley was a competitive, self-made man, uh, desperate to make a buck. Uh, twins owner Calvin Griffith called him, and not affectionately, the P.T. Barnum of baseball. Um, but he was um, also you know, to his credit, had an eye for talent and had assembled that team that won three World Series in a row. Um, 
Also on, on the Mets was, you know, Willie Mays in his final season. Uh, he'd come there, of course, in uh, mid-72 and um, was playing out. And, you know, I think he's arguably the greatest player of all time. Um, certainly Babe Ruth uh, is the other one that uh, could wear that mantle. But And, and maybe Shohei Otani one day will eclipse them both. But, you know, he's just such an amazing five-tool player. And I don't have to tell you guys just how great he was. You all know that and can appreciate that. But by 73, it was just painful to watch him out there in the outfield losing balls in the sun, and particularly during the World Series stumbling around the bases, falling down, coming out of the batting box. And yet um, he still somehow managed to come through in the clutch. He hit a Baltimore chop for the game winner in the final game of the uh, National League Championship Series and um, hit another big hit in the extra innings of uh, game two in the World Series. Uh, so, he, I mean, he still uh, flashed uh, signs of the old Willie Mays despite that uh, his faded faded and worn glory. Um, and then on, against, you know, playing uh, in the outfield on the other team, uh, the A's was Reggie Jackson, who was a chest thumping loudmouth. And again, you know, when you think about today, it, that doesn't really uh, see, he, he wouldn't stand out as much, but back then he did. I mean, this was, you know, an era when guys like uh, Willie Mays would hit a home run or, or um, Hank Aaron and, they just were expected to trot around the bases with their head down and uh, touch home plate and go to the dugout. But uh, Jackson was the kind of guy who would tell you what he was going to do and then he'd do it and then he'd tell you what he'd done because um, he had the talent to back up his hype. And I think his ego epitomized the me generation, um, his, his teammate, but which, and, and so he became the prototype of the modern superstar. And his teammate, Daryl Knowles, said of him, there isn't enough mustard in the world to cover that hot dog. Um, he was actually the MVP of the his first World Series in 1973. He'd missed 72 because he tore his hamstring uh, sliding home in the championship game against the um, the uh, Tigers. But uh, it wasn't until 1973 when he, sorry, he, he won his uh, first MVP of the World Series in 73, but it wasn't 77 until uh, he hit three home runs on three consecutive pitches against three different pitchers when he earned the moniker, Mr. October. Um, but Mr. Class that season was Hank Aaron. Um, he began the season 41 homers shy of Babe Ruth's 714 career home run mark. And by the time he reached 700 in July, Newsweek called him the most conspicuous, sorry, most conspicuous figure in American sports. And the New York Times ran a tell on its front page of his home run count. NBC interrupted its regular programming in September to show clips of each home run he hit. Um, and while he had the fans rooting for him, he also faced serious resistance from racists who didn't want to see a black man better a white hero. He uh, suffered not only taunts and threats from the out, or yeah, taunts and epithets from fans, including in Atlanta, you know, his, where he was playing his home team, but there was an outpouring of hate mail, um, death threats to him, to his children, um, and he just had this, he, he played that season under incredible pressure. At the same time, he bore it with a grace and dignity that I think makes him um, a hero and champion for all time. Um, and certainly one who, you know, I, I gained incredible respect for as I was researching that. And I remember, you know, where I was, uh, spoiler, he didn't hit 714 in uh, 1973, but I remember where I was in April of 1974 when I, uh, Al Downing served up that pitch that uh, he plopped over the left field fence to hit number 715. Um, and so I was uh, very happy to see him do that. Um, so those events, all that came together in the 1973 season. And I think it marked um, a watershed year for the sport and the game and changed the way that we uh, approach baseball and we appreciate baseball. And uh, for me, it was, you know, uh, well, the, the uh, subtitle of this book is How the 73 Season Changed Us Forever. And um, I'll stop there and I'd be glad to answer uh, whatever questions you have or comments you might have for me. John, first of all, thanks for a great presentation. Best way to get the book. 
Um, well, you can get it at the library. You can also order it online. Uh, I'd ask that you, or I encourage you to go through independent booksellers. <clears throat> so Indie Bound, okay. Indie Bound will uh, direct you to bookseller. If you're just, um, you, you can't help but use your Prime membership. Well, Amazon will get it to you as well um, overnight. And uh, certainly I also encourage you to support the brick and mortar stores, uh, particularly the independents in your neighborhood. So. Um, they're, they're all sports places you can find it. I, I got one question and one comment. Uh, did you have anything to do with the new cover or did the uh, uh, book company deal with that? No, I had quite a bit to do with the cover because they um, wanted kind of a classic photo of a guy hitting a ball. And I think they picked Reggie Jackson, you know, with a, a big swing. Um, and um I really like this photo and you, you may well recognize it. It's uh, game two, 10th inning the game was tied six, six. There's one out buddy Harrelson's on third base. Felix Mian hits a short fly to left. Joe Rudy caught it. Uh, Harrelson tagged. Rudy throws it home. It's just a little to the right of Ray Foss and the Oakland A's catcher. So he grabs it on one hop and he swings his glove over in Harrelson's direction to tag him. And um, Willie Mays is there. He's on deck and he's there on one knee in the batter's box on the left hand, left handed hitter batter's box watching. And Augie Donatella, the umpire, is a little on the other side and he um, calls, calls uh, Harrelson out and Mays can't believe it. And so this is the moment he's imploring. You know, Augie, like, what the hell? Are you kidding me? Sorry, let's see if I can, right? And that's Ray Fossey kind of wisely walking away in the background. Um, so, and of course, uh, uh, Yogi Berra comes out. You can watch this on YouTube, too. Yogi Berra comes out, and he's jumping up and down. I mean, he's literally hopping mad and saying, where did he tag him? Where did he tag him? And the ump says, on the, on the butt, I think, or on the rump. And um, he didn't. And you can watch it over and over. There's no way he'd take him on, on the rump. But Ray Fossey told me later that he had um, caught Harrelson on his the blouse of his jersey. Um, I'm not sure I, I buy that either. Um, but at any rate, you know, the umpire is always right. And so uh, the call stood and uh, for all of Willie May's protestations, it didn't work. Anyway, long answer to your question, I know. But I just thought that moment, there's, it shows such drama and such um, such uh, emotion that I just thought we got to go with it. Great cover. My one comment is I was 12 years old in 1973. Uh -huh. I was upstate in a bungalow colony. And in the bungalow colony, there was no TV, really. Everything was, you know, full of snow. Uh, the new owner of the bungalow colony you know, brought the te a television outside to see the all-star game. Hmm. And I remember the game that uh, Bobby Bonds won the MVP of the all-star game. I think it was played in Kansas city. And yes. that's, that's what I remember a lot of the summer of 73, not, not the fall classic or anything like that, but terrific presentation. Uh, Mr. Rothschild, you are up. Okay, yeah, that, that cover picture really shows a lot of emotion. Um, John, do you know John Ig well? John Ig, you Jonathan yes. Ig, yeah. Matter of fact, I just exchanged emails with him today. I had uh, I just finished reading his new biography of Martin Luther King, King. and he was, a, uh, he was a camper of mine when I had my day camp in Rockland. All okay. three Ig brothers came. And we still communicate, you know, infrequently, but I yeah. saw he gave you a. You know a good review so I yeah that was and, and, a little and he, bit. Actually, he actually wrote that 15 years ago and then he had me speak at uh to his men's club of his uh synagogue uh down in chicago that's um, where he is about hank greenberg but i tell you his new book i mean he obviously wrote a very good book about jack oh Rose, it's a, a big bestseller in the times and, my god yeah, right but he wrote a good book about um Jackie Robinson's first year. He wrote a really good book about Lou Gehrig, you know, the definitive biography, I'd say. Al Capone. Uh, yeah. And, well, and a great biography. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad great Ali. Biography about Muhammad Ali. 
And then the talk about Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I think it should get the Pulitzer. It's amazing. Um, That's great news. Yeah. So well, I if you speak to him again, tell him you want to Zoom with Steve Rothschild. Okay, I will do that. Yeah. You'll get a kick out of that. The well, thing I uh, want to add, I'm sure Harvey remembers this. In that 73, I guess it was the League Championship Series, when they knocked out Cincinnati, if I remember. Right. Mays got a huge hit, but it was another, like Vin Scully said, a 40 foot single. Right. But it, it kept the inning going. And, um, you know, it was the end. If you, if you spoke to Willie Mays 10 years ago about how bad he was in 73, he'd have answers for everything. The field was wet, the sun was bad. But, you know, it was kind of sad, but oh. he was, you know, like you said, he was probably the greatest player of all time. Well, thank you for coming on. Enjoyed it. You're welcome. And I'll say hi to Steve, or I'll Please. say hi to Don I from uh, Steve Rothschild. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clank, you are up. Thank you very much, Gary. And thank you, John. That uh, that was a, a big year for me. I, I, I was my first year in graduate school, and I tore myself away from the studies enough to see uh, the, the first DH and uh, certainly both the uh, playoffs and the World Series. I think my studies probably suffered, but I didn't in the long run. And Steve, I would I would tell you this, a 40 foot single is better than a 420 foot out. I'll never, I will not ever put a man down for putting a ball in play and Mays did it. Okay, um, two short questions and well, one short, uh, they're a little bit longer. Do you know what month the World Trade Center opened? I don't. Uh, it's probably buried in my notes somewhere, but I don't have it offhand. I took a I took path in from Newark, uh, and we made at what would have been, I guess, the World Trade Center the the change to go up uh, to 161st uh, on the whatever that is, the A or B train, Harvey knows. D D, D D D the D, D train. I took the D train up to Yankee Stadium, and it was my second Yankee Stadium game. Uh, uh, with a good buddy of mine. So I, I just wondered if I had passed under the World Trade Center as it was completed or if it was still uh, whatever. That was July 2nd of 73, that game that I went to. Went to. Huh. Um, gosh, I always have to revisit Mays in that series. And maybe you can tell me if you have any Mets you've talked to who had any comments about what happened. Now, I'll remind you that Jim Beecham, uh, in the uh, uh, fourth inning, uh, had his final major league at bat. It was a strikeout, a called strike uh, uh, three uh, uh, against Holtzman. So in the ninth, and Mays has already announced that he is retiring. Did you get any feedback from any players about the fact that Barra let him sit on the bench? He's a right-handed hitter. Daryl Knowles, a cunning lefty, had just been brought in, and he's facing Garrett, a left-handed hitter who had a horrible series. I mean, we can't go through Yogi's mind, but did you get any feedback from anybody about what they thought was going on when Mays wasn't called up in what would have been, you know, I mean, that's that's it. There are no more chances for Will. Right. Well, Obviously, Barrow, I, I didn't, uh, I don't recall any specific comments on that moment or that choice that Barrow made. I mean, there are certainly several decisions he made that could easily be second guessed, like starting Seaver in game six, which was not a must win when they're up 3 2 in the series. Um, and, uh, uh, but he, he and Mays had bickered and battled all, throughout the season, and there was no love lost between those two. And so I'm sure Yogi was not. Uh, feeling sentimental in the least. And even if, you know, and, and I guess I can't fault him either for uh, skipping over Mays in that, you know, the hindsight's, of course, 2020. But, you know, if I'm looking down my bench and I see Willie Mays and I'm thinking, here's this guy who's 42 who hasn't looked good so far. Do I go with him or not? And um, yes, he's Mr. Clutch. And yes, he's uh, he's got all that experience. But he wasn't he wasn't making a strong argument for himself with his play on the field that he was the guy to send up to the plate. It was two for seven in the series and one for three in the LCS. I, yeah. I mean, I, I'll stand behind Willie all day long on this, but you know, I'm kind of a, 
Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, you can certainly make a case for it. For me, it's just sentimental. I mean, I would have loved to have seen Willie up in that situation, but Yogi didn't consult me. How about the third? What's that? It was a, oh, actually, it was a pop out to a, a shortstop that uh, uh, Garrett had. I, I interviewed Garrett one time. I didn't know about that. I would have liked to have asked him about it. He's dead now, too, so no asking. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Harvey, you are up. Thanks, Gary. John, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, 1973 was an interesting year for everybody. Um, first of all, let me say what it, I think it's become expected of me to say. Willie was a six-tool player, maybe more. Five tools is not enough. The sixth tool was his no, his ability to see the whole field, his ability to move players around. Tom Seaver has talked had talked about this when Tom was still with us. And so I'll just leave it at that. Six tools. Norm Coleman's not here. He was at the game today. He didn't make it back. Norm has a seventh tool, and we're up to eight tools. And we're not saying it just because we're the New York Giants Preservation Society. It's a revisiting of the great Willie Mays. Secondly, very briefly about that 73 World Series. Yeah, Willie was stumbling around the outfield because he was trying to hang in there and catch a ball that was coming out of the sun. The low sun in that ballpark was terrible, and he hung in there. And as I recall, and I, I, I would Google this because I just can't remember it myself, but I have a vague recollection at the last actual hit that Willie Mays had in his wonderful career one game six or was the winning run in game six for the New York Mets yeah it bounced about four or five times to get through the infield but it was well placed I, I want to take a few, just a minute or two to discuss something else you discussed that it was the 50th anniversary of Roe v Wade Roe v. Wade was authored by Harry Blackman. Linda Greenhouse, who covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times for about 30 years, wrote a wonderful biography of Harry Blackman. And in that book, she had researched papers that were that are still in the Supreme Court library. And she found a note which indicated that the Supreme Court justices, apparently during oral argument, were passing notes back and forth about what was going on in the playoffs between the Mets and the Reds. In that book, there is a photograph of a, of a handwritten note. I think it says Mets 3, Reds 2, uh, indicating that these justices understood that baseball was as important as anything to them, a personal note. In 1973, I was an assistant district attorney in Manhattan, in New York County. And on a particular day in October, I was assigned to a youth part, or as they said in my cousin Vinny, a youth part. And the judge was um, Robert Haft. And the youth part was we did hearings, trials. It was it was a mill, but we did justice. And at one point in the afternoon session, Judge Half summoned me and the defense attorney, who was probably legal aid or public defender, up to the bench, and he said very simply, "The Mets are winning three to two, and Agnew has resigned." 1973. I told that story to Linda Greenhouse because she appeared at a at a lecture at a at a at a library in in our neighborhood. My wife and I attended it, and uh, she shook her head. She thought I said, "It's baseball up and down the line, the Supreme Court and uh, a youth part in Manhattan." Um, that's about all I have to add. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Thanks Gary. Gary. Thank Thanks for those stories. Those are a couple of good stories. 
John, I meant to ask you, I, 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 I did not read about this, but I, oh, I did read about it, but I'm not too sure about it. I know that uh, Ron Bloomberg, of course, was the first designated hitter, and that's basically his, his claim to fame, and he's known for that. Uh, I, I believe that the Yankees were playing the Red Sox and Orlando Cepeda could have been the first DH of all time. Uh, do you know the circumstances of why Cepeda didn't get up in time? Was it the batting order? What were the Yankees hitting? Because that I don't remember. Yeah, they the Yankees did play the Red Sox on that first day, and um, I tell that story, but it just Blomber, um, Blomber got to bat first. So was he was he closer to the top of the order for the Yankees, or the Red Sox weren't hitting well? Um, if I remember right, the, it was in Boston, and so they um, the Yankees had the first um, at bats, and uh, it was first inning when Blomberg got to bat. I'd have to double check that because, like I said, uh, it's been a, been a few years, but it I know I covered it in the book. Thank you. It would have been a better storyline for me if uh, uh, Cepeda had been the first. <laughs> but, uh, there's also a great quote from Blomberg. He said, um, "You know, he used to learn to hit by." Um, um, hitting blueberries in his backyard you know that's how he got the good hand-eye coordination but he didn't learn to um catch them <laughs> renee i can't believe you learned how to use the hand signal you are up thanks gary uh i love the pop culture uh i i'm really interested in this book um but you know i have some things i have to add to what bill and uh, harvey said on a personal note um I don't remember what year Mays had retired, but he played at an old timers game. And I forgot who hit it, but Mays had to run with his back, not a basket, uh, not, not a behind a, a, a shoulder catch, but he, he he ran out there and caught the ball and spiraled, you know, onto the ground. Now, I don't, again, I don't remember how many years he had retired. With that being said, uh, I, and I ha I I'm sure Harvey has seen it more than I have. I've only seen it six times. But the Say Hey Kid documentary, Reggie Jackson said, I don't care what anybody says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Willie Mays had trouble with the sun. He's the greatest of all. And I, as well as a lot of us agree with that. And, you know, it's easy to say what he, you know, he's 42 and, you know, he's, you said he's stumbling around, but, you know, he wasn't the only one that had issues catching that ball. I remember Joe Rudy, Cleon Jones, Don Hahn. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they all had issues. I really believe, like all of us here believe, if he saw the ball, he's going to catch it, like mm -hmm. Reggie said. And with that being said, you know, uh, I can't wait to get uh, get this book. Uh, uh, it's fun stuff. But uh, Mays, uh, uh, even though he was slow, he would have caught it. And, you know, uh, like Bill Clint said, you know, he drove in some a couple of runs in the postseason. So... This says a lot about a guy who, you know, his last two years left in the game. Thank you. Right. And obviously, Willie at his worst was a better ball player than I ever was at my best. <laughs> so uh, take what I say with a grain of salt. It's, it, you can watch their, um, you know, those games are on YouTube and you can find them. And it's not just that he loses the ball in the sun. He just looks really awkward out there with his no, foot. No. I get that. I remember that as a kid. I watched the game, and I was rooting for the Mets and Willie Mays, but to see, again, Joe Rudy, Cleon Jones, Don Hunt, you know, they all had issues finding the ball. They couldn't even get the ball because of the side. Right. But right. I understand what you're saying, but, you know, it's easy to point him out and nobody else. I'm just saying. Sure, Thank right. You. You're right. They all struggle with it. It's just, I think we've come to expect that to be a routine play for Willie Mays, right? And so then when we see him having trouble, it's so jarring to us that it's oh, uh yeah, it's absolutely. Way. And, I, 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 and uh, I, Kirk Gowdy both comment on that. And, uh, I agree with you. I mean, I thought uh, uh, Joe Rudy should have caught that ball too. I, I thought Cleon Jones should have had it too easily, but you know, the sun was there. Thank Renee, you. I would add one thing real quickly about Mays. Unfortunately, it wasn't just fielding from the standpoint of seeing the ball. George Theodore told me uh, in a story I wrote uh, about uh, Mays in the last season, he said, Mays, the arm was dead on a lot of times, on several occasions at least. Mays would catch the ball, 
and Theodore always ran over to him and he would flip him the ball and Theodore right. would turn right. it because yeah. his arm was dead, but he was smart enough, you know, one of those tools, smart enough to know, hey, I'll get it to George Theodore. He'll get it in. So that's uh, right. Uh, I mean, right. he compensated in ways, well, none of us can, including Wade Garrett for that. Thank and you. Mr. Manis, you are up. How you doing, John? Um, I remember watching the uh, game three of the 73 uh, uh, NL championship series. And when remember when, obviously we all remember when Rose barrowed into Harrelson and there was a big fight. Willie was actually one of the peacemakers. He was sent out by Yogi to go to left field and was pleading with the fans, stop throwing bottles, stop cursing Rose, blah, blah, blah. And Cleon and Jones, too. Excuse me? And Cleon Jones, too. Yeah, Cleon. Cleon, too. That reminded me of, of the Roseboro Marischal game when Marischal took the liberty of bashing Roseboro on the head a couple of times because a ball was by his ear. Willie was also a peacemaker in that game. He was actually on the field. Obviously, uh, he was in center field that day. And he was breaking up. He, he was getting Marischal in that bat away from Roseboro, who was bleeding, and Koufax was standing right next to Willie, but it was basically, I don't know if Koufax was just in shock or what. So uh, Willie, again, you know, was a peacemaker. First in, uh, I guess that was, what was that, 65 was the Roseboro game, and then uh, eight years later in 73. And in 73, my brother was a sports writer. He was covering the Mets for a paper in New Jersey, and he covered that championship series and the World Series. He told me that in the clubhouse, the Met clubhouse, after the game was over, they were treating Willie like he was the MVP because he got that pinch hit. It was a pinch hit single um, that barely, you know, was a hit and drove in the run, I believe. So Willie was taking all the champagne. He was getting drenched. And he, all he kept saying was, leave me alone. This is for the kids. The kids earn this. And if you think back to his, uh, you know, welcome to America, Willie, farewell speech. That was the attitude he had, that he was just doing this for the kids, for, for Seaver and Harrelson and, and Garrett and, and Cleon and all the young guys. And that was the kind of person, really, that really it, it transcended as being a great ball player. It was just the, the humility of the man. It's just simply amazing. Um, one more thing, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I happen to collect old newspapers, mostly when I was a kid, but I kept on collecting as I got a little bit older. I don't know if you can see this. It's coming out backwards in my picture, but this is the New York Times when Agnew resigned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, this is dated uh, October 11th, 1973. And on the other side, on the bottom, Mets win pennant, go to World <laughs> Series. So Spiro was the top story that day. And, and mm -hmm. I, to this day, I don't know if I saved the paper because of the headline on the top of that, Agnew, who I really didn't care for, or the fact that the Mets won the world, uh, won the championship. It happened to be on the same day, you know, I guess the tabloids went more crazy over the Mets, but the New York Times being the old gray lady. And of course now the New York Times is through with sports altogether, at least in the newspaper version. Um, that was a very big day. I was a college student. I was up in the Syracuse. So unfortunately I missed all the action. I had a class when that game was going on. I had to miss it because I think I was having an exam or something. But my brother said to me, Willie, was the hero as far as the young Mets were concerned. And uh, I don't know what, how Yogi felt. Yogi, yes, they didn't get along too well. And it's funny because when Yogi was a player way back in the 50s, when Willie was a young guy coming up, they were, they were, they were friendly. They attended a lot of award dinners together by the New York Press Association, the New York uh, chapter, the, the writers, baseball writers. But, yeah, things were pretty bad between Yogi and Willie by the time uh, that – that game was played and that year was taking place. But still, you, I'm going to read your book. Uh, it was a great year in 1973. And, and my Knicks won that year, too. So, I mean, couldn't go wrong in 1973. Thank you. Good year, Howard. <laughs> Howard, I was going to tell you that for those of us who lived in the Bay Area at that time, we got a real kick out of Agnew getting uh, uh, in peace. Well, he did no low to contend, Ray, uh, when he stepped down. But the thing is, in, in the South Bay area, the state <laughs> mental hospital is Agnew. <laughs> we always love that. All right, Mars, you are up. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Howard, for joining us. It was really very informative. You know, I, I watched Willie play in the polo grounds 
he is the greatest player. Uh, but I also saw Willie Mays charge a ball. The ball goes through his legs all the way out to center field, and the guy gets an inside-the-park home run. So as great as Willie was, like other ball players, they're going to make errors too. Now you, you talk about five-tool, six-tool, seven-tool, eight-tool players, you know, but uh, – I, I just heard a rumor that Willie Mays bought Sears Craftsman, so he now has more than eight tools. You know, <laughs> but the question I wanted to ask you was more about Yogi Berra and Willie Mays. What what other problems that they have? Do you know? Uh, well, yeah, I talk about them in the book. Uh, but for instance, early in the season, he went out to uh, see his wife, and uh, so Berra benched him when he got back. Um, didn't like that, that he just kind of left the team. I think Willie wanted um, maybe some special uh, favors granted him because of who he was or special consideration, special treatment. And Barra, of course, uh, you know, being a great ball player himself, didn't want to or didn't think he was do those probably and also didn't like his authority being challenged. So they battled all year. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. Mr. Matt, Greg Prince. Hey, th uh, thank thanks very much, Gary. Uh, enjoyed the presentation. Enjoyed your book. I bought, bought it so long ago. It was at a Borders bookstore, so that's been a while. Uh, just as an, an aside, yeah, vintage copy. Uh, Wayne Garrett still alive, still with us. Um, my question, though, uh, I, I will skip the Willie Mays stuff and just ask you. Uh, I know your book is has several tent poles because these are larger than life figures, larger than life stories, things that kind of resonate over time. What was the whole line that you came across in your research that's kind of lost to time? Maybe it wasn't a huge part of your book. Somebody that if we were having this talking about baseball in 1973, during 1973 would say, wow, that guy's having a great year. Or wow, can you believe this is going on? Is there, is there something we should be aware of that that isn't the sort of thing publishers put try to cram into book titles? Well, right. There are obviously plenty of moments that season that didn't necessarily have the narrative arc for a storyline to carry them through the season, but were significant. And perhaps my favorite is Nolan Ryan, who had pitched two no-hitters by the time of the All-Star game, and yet Dick Williams, the manager of the American League team, didn't put him on the roster. And so Boy Kuhn stepped in and he actually um, created an extra spot on the roster on both teams. And so Williams then was pressured to add Ryan. And in the National League, they added Willie Mays because um, he wasn't going to make the team otherwise, which would have ended his streak of, uh, I think, 22 consecutive years <clears throat> being the All-Star team. Anyway, um, then Ryan went on that to finish off the season by setting the single season strikeout record, besting Sandy Koufax by one. And uh, so, he, I mean, it was really a, a breakout year for him in many regards. Um, uh, so that, that was a fun year to, to watch. Um, or, or, you know, another fun aspect of that season, but I, it didn't qualify, I guess, or, uh, for a full storyline. But I saw again. I, I mentioned those events, and along with others, and the little All Star Game. I think Gary, you mentioned that at Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City. Right. Um, so there's and Bobby Bonds. Uh, there's some other good moments there. Any any players who spring to mind who aren't at that level though? Who you know, we all know Nolan Ryan. Is there anybody who was kind of a flash in the pan that sort of sticks with you from that season? Yeah. Um, well, there are guys like uh, Bert Blazevin who a little better than a flash in the pan, but was the loser of the American League All-Star Game as a 22-year-old, um, although as a 22-year-old, he's still in his fourth season in the major league. And then, of course, Gaylord Perry is another kind of fun storyline with his spitball. Um, but probably the most um, unusual was Mike Kikich and, Kikic and Fritz Peterson, two pitchers you may never have heard of, except that they switched lives. Not only did they swap wives, but they swapped Kids, dogs, houses, cars, and, uh, you know, just did a complete switch. And, uh, you know, that, that was the swinging 70s. Um, but 
uh, you know, th there were moments like that throughout the season that were just sort of, uh, again, kind of reflected the times and uh, were entertaining. Um, so, yeah, but they're, they're, I sprinkle those throughout as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for John? Steve, go ahead. Things, you know, we're all on the same page with Mays, <clears throat> but you have to look at Yogi Berra's side for a minute. He's managing perhaps the greatest player of all time, an icon, a, a contemporary, and there's all these young kids. So he wasn't going to bend. He wasn't going to do extra favors. And obviously he, he made, the, uh, to me, a great mistake in game seven, but it's water under the bridge. You mentioned the, the two scenes. One was with Bud Harrelson. The other one with Roseboro. I'm trying to think of others. And I thought of one that I remember seeing on TV. And we spoke about this one in 1958 or 59, when there was a beanball contest in Pittsburgh. And Raymond Monzant decided to take over. And he nailed one of the Pirates. And the baby bull comes out carrying a baseball bat. Unfortunately, right behind him was Willie Mays. And he tackled him. And I was a oh. young mate. Maybe he was 27, 28 tops. That's the first time I remember him doing anything like that. So Yeah, Cepeda came out of the dugout. He had the bat ready to brain somebody. Ready to ready I remember go. it well. And Willie, let's put it this way. He not only saved Cepeda's career, he kept him out of jail because Cepeda would have killed somebody. Those games were the ones that were on television. Pittsburgh. Yes, they, they were actually on... I remember it being on Channel 13, which later yes, became 13, PBS. Yes, absolutely, now, 13. Thank sorry, you. I, sorry I butted in. <laughs> That's okay. George Greger, did you have a question? Well, well, a couple of things. I wanted to thank John. Uh, as long as no one else has mentioned it, I want to remember Eddie Brousseau, who passed this week, leaving nine remaining uh, New York Giants, Start, uh, led by Billy Gardner and then Mays in terms of age. Thank you, George. Any other questions for John? I right, right, just wanted to ask about Ed Brasseau died this week. Yes. John, we can't thank you enough. Don't be a stranger. Again, yeah. this is the uh, reissue of his uh, 2008 book with, according to him, a much flashier cover. So... John, uh, you get this in Amazon and bookstores, independent stores, just as John said. John, don't be a stranger, okay? Get your email fixed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's give it up to right, John well, Rosengren. Thanks. Thank, thank you, John. Course, Good to see all of you. The uh, thank book you. on the Mays Marichelle, uh, the Marichelle Roseboro incident that John wrote. Uh, this is on our YouTube channel, but this is a book you got to own. John, thanks again. Give it up for John Rosengren. All right. Guys, Thank we will know. see each other in uh, two, weeks. two weeks. Have a great uh, couple of weeks and be well. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Bye, guys. Thanks, Gary.